I'm going to tell you a particular story and then the innovation that came out of that story. Um, and the innovation, uh, the problem begins not on the best coast, but on the south coast, and that is uh, uh, this problem, the Deepwater Horizon disaster, um, which was um, uh, one of the uh, nation's uh, worst disasters, worst oil spill disasters. Um, and it had a, a few particularly uh, unusual aspects to it. Uh, one is it occurred in very deep water, and another is that it was tremendously large. Um, what you see in the picture is uh, a half-billion-dollar vessel on fire as a result of a blowout, and 11 people died, presumed uh, dead, missing at sea. Uh, and resulting, uh, after the explosion, there was a 36-hour fire, and the vessel sank. But by the way, we're coming up uh, on the two-year anniversary of the explosion uh, in a few weeks. Um, so, the, let me tell you a little bit more about the, the situation here. Uh, so, what you see in the center of the, uh, of the picture is the Deepwater Horizon vessel. Uh, so, this is the Deepwater Horizon vessel right there, and it's connected to the blowout preventer through a long pipe called the riser pipe. That's the way, uh, that's the way things should be. So, after the disaster and the vessel sank, uh, what happened was that riser pipe that used to be standing there fell down onto the seafloor and I've drawn in a little cloud of oil that's coming out of there. Now, the big problem uh, is how do you uh, deal with this disaster? You know, how do you stop it? How do you prevent the oil from uh, reaching the shore, reaching the marshes? Um, and to answer that, those two questions, you need to know how much oil is coming out. How big is the problem? Uh, and that uh, question it was surprisingly difficult to answer. When you have a spill like we saw in Deepwater Horizon, you don't know, oil was never produced from the well, you don't know how much oil is coming out. So let me show you these three sketches here. Uh, previous technology in estimating the size of an oil spill looks like this. The oil comes out of wh whatever underwater source it's, it's leaking out of, floats to the surface, you measure the size of the oil spill on the surface of the water by flying an airplane or a satellite over it, estimate how thick the oil is, and then simply do some multiplication. You get the volume of the oil that's spilled. That's really easy stuff. However, Deepwater Horizon, because it was in such deep water, totally changed that picture. Uh, and in fact, um, looking at the far right frame, here's what we saw in the Deepwater Horizon disaster. Oil came out of the... Uh, um, the blowout preventer, you know, spilled into the ocean. They were applying uh, dispersants at the, uh, at the seabed. And what happened? Well, some of the oil dissolved into the oil, uh, dissolved into the seawater. An unknown fraction of the amount of the oil dissolved into the seawater. And then the oil that uh, did make it to the surface, it didn't appear in one big contiguous slick like with um, the Exxon Valdez, for instance, because it had to bubble up through a mile of seawater. So it broke apart into many disparate uh, slicks. Uh, very difficult to estimate the amount of the oil flow. What I did, um, where I came into the, uh, the uh, picture here, is in estimating that uh, I thought what we needed was a different way to estimate the size of the uh, oil spill. Um, and so what you're looking at here, this is the riser pipe, you know, that long, mile-long pipe that I talked about, it's lying on the seabed now, you see, in a horizontal orientation. And what you see coming out, you saw clouds of white stuff, clouds of black stuff. The white stuff is natural gas, the black stuff is oil, crude oil. Um, and what I'd like you to notice, I'd like you to notice two things. The first is, what a bad image this is. Um, just poor production quality. And uh, it's uh, making a little bit light of it, but, um, but you'll see in a second why that's important. Uh, and the second is, if you watch this video, you see clouds of uh, oil billowing out, and you can identify those clouds. You can watch them move downstream, just like if you were laying on your back watching the clouds outside. You can watch the clouds move across the sky. So my idea was, well, we can track those clouds as they, um, as they move away from the uh, exit of the oil, uh, uh, as, the, as they move away from the exit of the pipe, we can track those clouds and relate that to the volume flow rate of the oil. Um, and this relates to uh, some other research, my, my typical research uh, activity. By the way, this is, I work with uh, Professor Klimek. I'm a, more of a nanotechnology guy, and this is definitely mega stuff. Um, but I could translate what I 
normally do to this, um, to this problem. Okay, so uh, the uh, situation then, what I did was to look at these clouds uh, that were, were coming out of the end of the pipe and to analyze how those clouds moved. And to show you just how easy that is, you can look at it here, uh, and I have the arrow pointing to one particular little structure. So the arrow shows you how in consecutive frames you can watch these structures move. So it's really easy then to estimate how fast are those structures moving and then to uh, use that speed to estimate the volume. You need to know the size of the pipe, the diameter of the pipe, but then to estimate the volume, the barrels per day of the oil that's flowing out of the pipe. It seemed like an obvious idea to me, but it wasn't apparently an obvious idea. Uh, so, um, let me tell you a little bit more. I mean, the, it's really easy stuff. To point that out, this is the mathematics that backs up the analysis that I'm telling you about. And if, I'm not going to go through it, but if you take a look at the mathematics there, there's nothing more complicated than uh, division or multiplication. Now, you can do this on a four-function calculator. Um, and after you, do, some, you know, do these calculations, you end up calculating the volume flow rate of the oil which is what I did, and I calculated 70,000 barrels per day. And at the time, this is uh, mid-May uh, of 2010, at the time, uh, BP was claiming uh, 5,000 barrels per day uh, was the volume flow rate of the oil. And uh, so, I, as I was doing these calculations, I thought my numbers seemed relatively large, you know. I didn't think I heard the number 70,000 before. Uh, and so I went to Google and looked this up, and you know, there's what BP was reporting, 5,000 barrels per day, based on this surface analysis that I talked about. And, uh, and 70,000, that's more than an order of magnitude larger. Um, so, fortunately, so here's my numbers here. I, I estimated 70,000 plus or minus 20%, and that's the range for that. Um, fortunately, within, uh, within about a day of my analysis, there were a couple of others uh, who backed me up, and they also had the same range. I mean, 20 to 100, the center there is 60, so it's very close to my analysis. Um, so all outsider estimates are higher than BPs. That's, that's the important message. Um, and that's what this innovation led to, was you know, a, uh, an innovation in um, calculating the size of an oil spill. Um, so in order to do this more precisely, you saw that range you know, on, on, uh, on my colleagues, the range, 20 to 100,000 barrels per day, that is a significant range. In order to tighten that range, we needed both scientific and technology advances. So here's a, a, a technology advance. You see this picture is a much better uh, quality picture. Essentially, just getting a better camera, a higher spatial resolution, higher temporal resolution to look at the oil. Um, allows you to improve your results substantially. Uh, and then on the science, the science end, estimating or correlating the speed of these structures that you see, how, those, how the speed of those structures relates to the speed of the oil, um, that's a, a scientific advance. And so we, we spent a lot of time working on that. And by the end of the summer uh, of 2010, had significantly improved results and we're able to calculate the impact of that oil spill. Uh, and so here's the really bad news about this situation. Uh, five, uh, sorry, five million barrels of oil spilled uh, over the 87 days that the, um, the well ran unchecked. And if you put that in terms of the previous yardstick by which we quantify oil spills, uh, which was the Exxon Valdez, it's 19 times. You know, imagine 19 Exxon Valdezes, you know, lined up in the Atlantic Ocean and steaming into the Gulf of Mexico. That, that's one every four and a half days in Exxon Valdez. So that's a tremendous impact, um, and, and one that we need to to work on improving, um, you know, oil spill safety. Uh, so that's all I have for today, and uh, thanks for the invitation.